Argentina, Bob and John review the findings from the German leg of their investigation, where a declassified MI6 document reporting that Adolf Hitler was flown from a makeshift runway in Berlin on April 29, 1945, led the team to uncover a never-before-known fifth exit from Hitler's Führer bunker. Well, for me, the most mysterious part is, is exit five. Here's the entry. From there, it goes into a tunnel. Precisely at this point, the, the East German secret police, the Stasi, were conducting their own investigation. A declassified Stasi file reveals that this fifth exit would have connected to a 2,000-foot-long tunnel ending at the base of the Brandenburg Gate. This iconic monument marks the beginning of Tiergarten Park, which was redesigned by Hitler to be the crown jewel of his capital city. So what did he get him getting in the middle of the terror garden at the Brandenburg Gate? Brandenburg Gate, Hitler, plane. Let's take a look at this uh, document here. So this is dated December 29, 1949. The reporting agency is the Soviet Union. A plane which was piloted by Hannah Rush on the 28th of April flew out of Berlin from the Brandenburg Gate. According to this document, it looks like it's a runway. It was a makeshift runway. And they're flying out as late as the 28th of April, which is only one day before Captain Baumgart flew Hitler from perhaps the same location. If Hunter Reich leaves on the 28th, makes it out successfully in a test run, if you like, Hitler could have got out of Berlin the day after where there's smoke, there's fire. Could this be the makeshift runway Hitler used to escape from Berlin? Is it even reasonable to fly in and get out on the 29th of April right. when the Russians were circling the city? We can go in and we can corroborate that there was indeed this makeshift airstrip. We may really have something here. She's able to fly a plane in and out of here on April 28th. Allegedly on April 29th, Baumgart flies Hitler out of here. Lenny DePaul and Sasha Kyle investigate the avenue running from the Brandenburg Gate through Tiergarten Park in search of evidence that it could have been used as a makeshift runway. So, Sasha, take me back. April, let's say April 20th to the 30th. Did the Nazis occupy this area right here? From the Brandenburg Gate to the Victory Column. This was defended to the last hours of the Third Reich. This was the last stronghold controlled by German army and by Hitler. All the other airstrips and airports were done and uh, uh, forced by the Russians in these days. Victory Column was what? In the massive foundation of the Victory Column, they placed the radar control and uh, aircraft control. Can we get in the uh, Victory Column? Yes. Can you get me up top? Yeah. Let's go. I gotta see this. What a vantage point that would be. It was a kind of jewel, a, a gem of the government. It was a hotspot for the fighting in the last war days. Wow, this whole place is shut up. The Russians with uh, General Konya, the troops were just over there a few hundred meters, and uh, they knew that uh, German soldiers were inside. Look at these bullet holes, Sasha. I can't believe this. This was pretty much the last stand for the Germans. So this place was held up for a reason. By April 24th, 1945, the advancing Soviet army encircled the once pristine capital of the Third Reich. With each passing day, the Soviets tightened their grip around the heart of Berlin, forcing nearly all remaining Nazi troops to retreat and defend a four square mile area of the inner government district, which included the Fuhrer bunker. Tier Garden Park and the Victory Column. I got chills just thinking about the Russians are outside shooting at us with everything they got. The Russians were 100 meters out. High ranking Nazi officials. They knew they were signing their death warrant right there. Why would they be here? Oh, wow. Holy cow. They got to be kidding me. You can see enemy Russian aircraft yeah. coming in. 
makes sense from this vantage point. You got a makeshift runway right here. There's only one reason that the Nazis would be held up here in this tower. This is basically an air traffic control tower. Where's the fear of bunker from here? 600 meters, six to seven hundred. Spuckman. He could jump in the tunnels through the tear garden to here. The team has now uncovered a new exit from Hitler's fear of bunker that would have led to a tunnel below Tear Garden Park and connected directly to a massive boulevard extending from the Brandenburg Gate. I get the length of this as a makeshift runway, but width-wise, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, look at the length, it's perfect. But what about these lampposts? How are you gonna get wings of an airplane down here? Like every uh, 15, 20 yards apart, right? Hundreds, the whole line. Taking a look at the lampposts that were every 10 meters apart, it would have been very risky to accommodate an aircraft. Not only was Adolf Hitler tactically sound, he was a forward thinker. I mean, those lampposts could have easily clipped their wing and their whole escape plan would have been grounded. And it's just a gut feeling, but as a criminal investigator, it just doesn't add up. The way it looks right now, for the wingspan of this aircraft to get up and down this runway, it's a death trap. That's an eerie looking building, and I can just imagine what had occurred there. While waiting for an update from the German leg of their investigation, Bob and John focus their attention to the findings from the jungles of Misiones, Argentina, where they have discovered a new fourth structure in the same area that a declassified Argentinian document reports a Nazi militarized outpost after World War II. I think this is just an anomaly. It's just like glaring huge. Who builds a two-story structure with reinforced walls, very thick bolts in the middle of the jungle? I mean, it looks like somebody took a plan from maybe a barracks and said, all right, go put this in Missiones out in the jungle where nobody can see it. The more we get into the Missiones site, the more it starts looking like something military related. According to the Argentine report, this was a military zone. And voila, what do we have here? A military type structure. You put soldiers there, supplies, and then that would protect the main residences. I truly think this is huge. I mean, I, I think it is huge. Always lingered in my mind in the first part of our investigation is, okay, if it was Hitler that's in that building or some other high value target, yeah, where are the people that are providing the security for him? Are they living yeah, in the no, same exactly. building? I mean, he right. just didn't go out there and set up this mansion, you know, and, and do everything himself. But now we're talking about some place you could put personnel that wouldn't be right in wherever you lived. I'd like to see artifacts that relate to soldiers, soldiers that would be used for the protection of a high value target. If this was a militarized outpost, you need soldiers to fortify it. And so they would have left evidence behind. I think we're clever enough to uh, find out who's in that building exactly. Deep in the jungles of Misiones, Daniel Chavazan has granted Tim Kennedy and Alistair Brooks access to his base camp, the home for thousands of artifacts Daniel has uncovered from the four structures that make up this Nazi jungle hideout. This is from all the sites you've been working yes, on. Absolutely all the camp from inside the south. Find the two-story building significant. We need to find clues in these artifacts that will tell me who the people are that were using it and what they were doing here. How many artifacts have you found in your excavation work? For the moment, over 4,000 fragments and items, but we keep digging. As you'd likely expect, my eyes caught by the oh. ceramics. <laughs> yeah, you're an expert on that. This one's particularly interesting to me. A gravy boat in the middle of the jungle? That suggests a certain level of dining activity. And these structures are in the middle of nowhere. Why would you have a level of formal dining, a level of that aspiration to gentility in these households? I don't think there's any question that anybody can doubt somebody was prepared to stay here for as long as they wanted and could feel safe. 
This is particularly interesting because it has a German maker's mark. That's Villeroy Bosch. If I were to find this in, say, Buenos Aires, I might not be too surprised. Here in Misiones, on the banks of the Paraná River, in these sites that are complex of sites that are hidden away, that's more remarkable. This is highly breakable, highly fragile materials made in Germany. Accepting that Hitler's style of living was higher end, there is connection, an unexpected level of formal dining here in the jungle. This doesn't look like somebody is there to hide. This is like somebody is there to live comfortably. And to me, for a high value target like Adolf Hitler, to be comfortable and safe, that means military type protection. That means that they have soldiers around them. Have you found anything that is military or that would be used to protect somebody that can live this comfortably? Yes, we have some other thing. Oh, here you have, for example, bullets. And this is obviously 9 millimeter bullets. This bullet has been used historically to protect the most important people on the planet. And it's still used today for that exact same reason. Of all the different things that you found, of all the different fragments of bottles, medicine, trash, cans, the military items were the least frequent. That made a lot of sense to me. These are not guys who are going to be losing bullets, dropping magazines, losing guns. These are trained soldiers. They're not going to leave a trace of what they're doing or how they do it. I would almost want to segregate all of these artifacts. In my mind, the people that were living comfortably the people that were secure, the people that were being protected, and then everybody else. The person that is using this, I think, is protected by the people that are using that. It's Brandenburg Gate, the Victory Tower, this avenue cuts right through it. This is a possible runway. Bob and Sean review the findings of their investigation to determine if the street between the... One way to fly Hitler out of Berlin in the final days of the war, as reported by a declassified MI6 file. We got the victory column. Its height certainly could have been used for makeshift air traffic control center. You've got all the makings of a runway, except problems with the wingspan. And it's getting very convincing that Hitler left to the tear garden. You know, Hitler bring his troops in, uh, you know, sort of the last defense, certain wagons. So tear garden is looking really good, except for the lampposts that run down the road, because that makes it very hazardous place to take off. Not the kind of risk a good planner would have built into this the main thing is the light bulbs. How do you get an airplane in there? Is it even doable? To right. Is the avenue wide enough? I mean, that's really the question. Yeah, I think that's key. Absolutely key. Systems. I need dimensions, I need the width of the street and the Brandenburg Gate for the column. We can do it. We will generate a 360 with this territory providing 256 megapixels in each second. With seven laser scanners and a 360 degree camera array, the Leica Pegasus 2 is used by forensic analysts all over the world to transform crime scenes into 3D models with accuracy down to the millimeter. The result of the scan will allow the investigative team to examine Hitler's possible escape route from every angle. Well, go work your magic. While the Leica laser scan gets underway. Leather, thanks for coming back out. Hey, uh, don't drink. Lenny meets up with Sasha Kyle, who has uncovered evidence from local photo archives and has made an important discovery. This is before the war, and you can compare this line with the modern man pose. Yeah, right, right. As you can see, it's the same line. So, the second one. This is from April, May 
bloody 45. And you see, no lentils. Wow. The German troops, they touched them at the ground level here and had more space. Tell me they eliminated these poles on both sides, right? Yeah. This is unbelievable. Somebody was under a direct order to cut these things down for a reason. So here you got the lamppost, here you don't, which yeah. gave them at least another 20 feet on each side to get an airplane down here. It makes absolutely no sense for those lampposts to be cut down unless you want to accommodate or fit something down this road. You can only imagine this was a contingency plan that was in place by Adolf Hitler. The place was caving in on He was backed into a corner and he needed to get out of Dodge and hurry. Yeah, there's a method to his madness. I'll give the devil his due. He fought this thing out. Boom, he's on this makeshift runway and he's gone. Me, the puzzles were put together. We could be on the verge of uncovering evidence that will change this case forever. We're looking for an embargo. Every día en el kilómetro 260. of structures left derelict in a Parisian park. There seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. It's all on hunting Hitler. Borman's headquarters, Tangier, Morocco. Borman goes to Tangier to set up the Fort Wright. <laughs> This has all the markings of a military command center. If Hitler is going to come back, weapons are absolutely crucial. In Buenos Aires, Mandel's bicycle and plastic plants began to produce machine guns, airplanes, bullets, and bombs. I have explosive detected. It's detected TNT, Tim. Yeah. After the end of the Second World War, there was a meeting between Juan Perón, the president of Argentina, and Martin Bormann in Buenos Aires. The deeper we get into a Fourth Reich in Argentina, the more I'm convinced. Look, what we got is a secret Nazi headquarters in Tangier, Morocco. It's connected to Bormann, who was Hitler's right-hand man. We've got a munitions factory in Argentina, which we've now established there was government support for the Nazis. And we've got 10,000 Nazis fleeing Europe, heading for South America. I mean, these pieces are telling a story that's changing history. CIA veteran Bob Baer and war crimes investigator Dr. John Sensich are overseeing a dual-pronged investigation. While the team in Tangier, Morocco has uncovered a possible Nazi headquarters where a declassified MI6 file reports Martin Bormann organizing the Fourth Reich, the team in Buenos Aires, Argentina has discovered a munitions factory with Nazi ties operating after the war. The deeper we get into this, it's looking like these people truly believe that they were going to arm, establish the Fourth Reich, and they were going to win this time. The evidence is out there. They were planning something. But they weren't going to simply rearm in Argentina and drive a tank division all over South America. The only way that they were ever going to, to make this happen is some sort of weapon of mass destruction. This has always been the dream of dictators. It's always been the dream of countries that have failed. So there's no reason to believe the Nazis would not entertain fantasies like this. Attacks with weapons of mass destruction do change the game. After the utter defeat of Germany, the only way for Hitler to come back was a giant weapon. You need to take a look at this. This is a map of Manhattan. This map came from the internal files of an engineer in the Nazi Luftwaffe, the Air Force. It depicts a plan developed in 1944 to bomb the United States, and more specifically, Manhattan Island. This is chilling. I mean, they had a plan for mass destruction in the United States using a weapon with a kill radius which would have taken out Manhattan. That's a scary thought.
if Hitler lived, one of his principal targets would have been New York City. By attacking New York City, it strikes at the heart of Americans, it strikes at the heart of the free world all over. I guarantee you that even after the war, they were all the more motivated to hit Manhattan, because that was their only hope of ever coming back. And somebody told Hitler that this was doable. We know how close the Nazis actually got toward having a workable nuclear weapon during the war, then that brings in an entirely different perspective on the Fourth Reich's actual operational capacity after the war. I totally agree. And what we have to do now is dig into the database and see how far the Nazis got. Could they have made one? All right, let's see what we got here. Region in Germany. Nuclear. All right, here is a document from the District Council in Thuringia, Germany. It's a deposition of Claire Werner, and it goes on to say that on March 4th, 1945, a Wehrmacht officer told me that today world history would be rewritten. I was at my window to look over the military training ground in the evening. There was suddenly a brightness like hundreds of bolts of lightning so bright that you could read a newspaper. Afterwards, there was a very powerful wind. Later I had, like many residents in the area, nosebleeds, headaches, and pressure in the ears. This woman is living next to a base in Thuringia. She's standing at her window and there's this explosion, which fits a, a nuclear bomb, exactly fits one. If we want to know what was going on during the war, we need to send a team to Thuringia. And I guarantee you, if you can make a bomb and send it off in Thuringia, you can easily transport the same technology to the war. Let's see what we can find in Thuringia. That's the big story. In Thuringia, Germany, World War II historian James Holland and Third Reich expert Sasha Kyle arrive at the outskirts of a former Nazi training base in the location that Claire Werner claimed to have witnessed an explosion from her window. Now this is the room. Thank you. Gosh, look at this. This is our uh, area of interest. And suddenly you see this huge flash of light that lights up the room so much that you could read a newspaper from it. That would seem apocalyptic. When you're thinking of the Second World War, bombs, you're thinking of a huge eruption of debris and grit and suddenly lots of smoke. But you're not expecting blinding flash of lights and mushroom clouds. So we need to find out what was going on here in Thuringia. I brought you something from the military archives. We found some aerial photos. This one is from 1944, and this one, one year later. Looking at it, you can see the blast damage. This dark area here, the sense of spread kind of pushing out. In the 1944 picture, the area in question is nice and clear. The one that follows a year later, there's a blast that's spread out from a kind of epicenter. So where is that blast area? We're standing in the middle of a castle, which is on a hill surrounded by trees. Boom, there. There's our castle, there's our surrounding of trees. And then if I look out this window, what I'm looking at is a long, narrow, wooded ridge. Long, narrow, wooded ridge. So if I'm here and I'm looking out through there, my view is sort of across there. That's our area. We have to go there. We sure do. If our photo analysis is correct, that epicenter is just there. And so you can see the land drops, so that's going to shield a lot of the blast, isn't it? Yeah. Here we go. This is it. Here's our track. Yep. 
This is the deepest point. Look at it. It's basically empty. Nothing. All around. 360 degrees. It's like a hidden crater. I mean, it's just the perfect place to do it because A, we know this is a military training area in the 1940s. And B, it's a pretty safe, secluded area. Where we are in Argentina, on this shore, I can look across and see Paraguay. I want to go to Brazil. I just go a little bit up this river right here. I'm in Brazil. It's perfect. I'm looking for one thing places where Nazis can go hide. One in particular. Here we are in northern Argentina, and we have found just that the perfect hiding spot for a Nazi on the run. In 2014, an executive order declassified over 700 pages of secret FBI documents, revealing that the U.S. government was investigating Adolf Hitler's whereabouts months and years after he was believed dead. In these files, there are thousands of leads. This is report after report after report. They had an active investigation looking for this guy. Bob Baer, 21-year CIA veteran and one of the most renowned intelligence minds in the world, has reopened a 70-year-old cold case, the death of Adolf Hitler. All the witnesses are dead. There's no fingerprints. There is no decent forensics. It's the biggest mystery of the 20th century. Armed with newly declassified FBI documents and the most cutting-edge technology, Bob has assembled a team of the most respected experts in the world to carry out an international investigation. We are not going to make our conclusions in advance. I just want to do the definitive investigation of Hitler and for once and all, settle this damn thing. Hitler is living in a great underground establishment. Toronto's our place. Did they fly the swastika flag? Mm. Find me a bunker? There's definitely an area of interest down here. Holy moly, look at this. It may have been Hitler was in Toronto and then got up and moved several months later. The Nazis and Missionis are reported to control a system of roadways known only to them. We need Tim Kennedy there on the ground. Uh, we've got to do it now. 600 miles north of Buenos Aires, in the remote region of Misiones, Argentina, Tim Kennedy, U.S. Army Special Forces, heads into the dense jungle to follow a lead in a declassified FBI file that could place Hitler living in this area at one point. I'm having a 4x4 four four truck, and it takes us forever to get out here. As an archaeologist, whenever I look at a, a new site, I try and stay very neutral about it. I don't get too excited so I don't bias my judgment. Bob has arranged for Philip Kuhnen, expert on German archaeology, to join Tim in the investigation. This site in particular is, seems very problematic not to get emotionally involved to it because there's so much mystery. You know, there's so, so many unknowns. For decades, only legends and local folklore have provided an explanation for three mysterious stone structures, isolated from society and inaccessible by roads. But recently, a team of archaeologists began unearthing artifacts that suggest that this site served a sinister purpose to provide a safe haven for Nazis on the run. This would have been way out of town. After driving through the night, Tim and Philip reach base camp. Daniel Shavelson, the director of the dig, is responsible for dating this complex to the 1940s. Tim and his crew will be the first outsiders to investigate this site. What we are trying to do is to understand who was living there, what the purpose of the buildings, when the building was used. Does this stuff tell you anything? All these objects from the excavation, all this 20th century. A lot of these cans seem to be the same size. I don't know if these are sardines or sardinas, corned beef, milk. From my perspective, when you have 
a hideout, it's pre-positioned and planned. Mm -hmm. And you would find stuff like this ready that's sitting there that's ready yeah. to be used. Yeah. This was all canned food, canned meats. Whoever lived here could have lived off that food for a long period of time. Daniel shows the team the newest discovery pulled from the site just days earlier. This is a box made 1940. It's in frame. Uh, we found inside the wall we was lucky to find it. Inside there are several things. Here we have the coins. This is very interesting. Uh, there we go. That's swastika. There you are. Nazi coin. Yeah. From the period of the Third Reich. Oh my god. See a Nazi coin. It takes your breath away. The swastika, even now, is so powerful. Finding this coin is an indication that Nazis were living here. We have a kid wearing a Nazi uniform with a swastika on his arm. It's an incredible picture. Um, if you see the other thing, that's a picture. Oh. Just have Hitler and Mussolini taking a stroll. Without a doubt, this is French evidence that there were Nazis here. After seeing that, I want to get on that property so bad. I want to understand what was going on there. At first light, Tim, Philip, and Daniel hide deep into the jungle to investigate the complex. I'm coming to this site with a bunch of questions. I want to know who built this complex. Why did they build this complex? If I get these questions answered, I can discern if it was possible a high-level Nazi could have come here. Here you have building one. It's an impressive construction in the middle of the jungle, made by stones. Look at you. That's the door, and you have a veranda. What's the purpose of a veranda in the middle of the jungle? A very happy home. This is the kind of entrance you might see to a house in Europe. For sure, it's not made by a local architect. This is majorly labor intensive to build this. The choice of material indicates that. So if you wanted to build something quick and cheap, you would use wood or bricks. But here they've actually quarried stone. It's a lot more work than shipping bricks here. Oh, absolutely. But if you buy a great amount of bricks by the city, everyone knows. Yeah. By the two or three, four people working in the middle of the jungle, nobody knows. We have two bedrooms, a kitchen, a restroom and the remains of the original floor. Blue and yellow tiles. See the yellow? And the blue. A complex floor. It's too much floor for a jungle house. Whoa. It's a real modern restroom. That's the place for the toilet side. That's a right. reservoir for the tank for, for the time. And here you have the for toilet paper. It's uh, it's too too much work. This is our name. Wow, look at that. The tiles are glass tiles. This is weird. It is um, a two bedroom, one bath house in the middle of the freaking jungle. Adolf Hitler was known for his opulence. A declassified U.S. military file from 1943 reports that at the height of the war, Hitler had a special plane bringing him asparagus and bonbons fresh daily from Paris. And he set up 10 intricately built headquarters throughout Europe, with his private Burghof residence in Bavaria, adorned with rare marble and wood walls and priceless antique furniture. We know there were Nazis here, and this house 
was built for somebody that has a very high standard of living. Obviously, Hitler is the figurehead to the entire Nazi movement. So if that man's on the run, it's going to be a place like this that he would run to. We're on to something. This compound in Missiones is turning out to be something important. CIA veteran Bob Baer and war crimes investigator John Sinsich review the on-the-ground findings from the jungles of Misiones, where a declassified FBI document led the team to a mysterious complex in the north of Argentina. Who builds a, a town bathroom in the middle of the jungle? If we were talking about the 1970s and the 1980s, we're going to be looking at some drug dealers. But here, back in the 1940s, it, it just it doesn't fit. What kind of Nazi withdraws deep into the jungle, into a fortified compound, and this opulence, except somebody very important? Missione is, is, is extremely interesting because if you're protecting Adolf Hitler, he's not going to show up and stay at the local hotel. And to find a facility in the Argentine jungle tied to Nazi Germany is huge. It gives a lot of validity to the FBI reports. With evidence from Missione's now providing corroboration of the FBI files, the team considers opening a new front in their investigation. We need parallel inquiries. We need Tim Kennedy to continue digging in South America, but the other part of this equation is what happened in the Fuhrer bunker in Berlin leading up to April 30th, 1945. I totally agree with you. We simply go back and re-examine Berlin, and that's what really interests me. Could he have faked his death or not? There's two sources of evidence that we want to take a look at. Two main sources have been used throughout history to determine that Hitler committed suicide in his bunker. Source one, testimonies from members of the Nazi inner circle all claimed that Hitler and Eva Braun took poison and then Hitler shot himself before their bodies were wrapped in blankets, carried out of the bunker, and burned. Source two, official reports from the Soviet troops who stormed Hitler's bunker and controlled the crime scene, along with all forensic evidence. I want to get Lenny DePaul on the ground in Berlin to look at both sources. Former U.S. Marshal, he's done this, man hunts, and if he can establish that he did die in the bunker, this investigation's over, of course. Right. Lenny DePaul, one of the most skilled manhunters in the world, makes his way through a Nazi bunker built in 1942. I was the commander of over 380 full-time investigators. We were mandated by the United States Congress to go after the most violent felony fugitives around the world. If somebody's on the run, we're the ones that's chasing. The first step in any investigation where somebody has allegedly killed themselves is to find out if, in fact, they did do that. I've had fugitives drive cars off of bridges.